Good Sunday morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Sunday School this day. I do have a confession to make. I hadn't actually planned on being quite so dressed down for Sunday School. However, Doug Miller reminded me that you may well be in your pajamas, so hey, <laughs> I'm dressed down too. And speaking of Doug Miller, we owe him a lot of credit and thanks for all he is doing. He's doing this, you all, for all he is doing to make our web and Facebook opportunities to be together possible. So thanks to Doug and to all of the folks who do our techie stuff that make that happen. One of my favorite things in all the world is the telling of faith stories. Sometimes faith stories are autobiographical. The person to whom is happened is sharing the story. Those are the best. Some are biographical, and the Bible is full of those stories where someone wrote down their story or someone else's story. And thank goodness we have those stories. The Bible, with its stories, some are just inspiring. They, we think, oh, there's no way I could ever have a faith like that. And then with others, we go, oh my, oh my. <laughs> I'm glad that's not my story. I'm glad mine isn't recorded for all of eternity like that story is. But every one of them is so very special. In today's sermon, we are talking about Thomas, but we're also touching on two other faith stories because they were part of our Lenten series. And so I thought we would dig a little bit deeper into those and then go to a fourth story. No, you're not going to be here till three o'clock this afternoon, I promise. The first one is that of Nicodemus. I call his story Nick at Night. It is probably my very favorite story in the Bible, but I will be honest, they're all my favorite story in the Bible. But I really do like Nicodemus' story. We have to remember that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And you know, Pharisees kind of looked down on others. The Pharisees were constantly taunting and trying to trap Jesus with the law. So you can imagine this night, a knock came on the door where Jesus was staying. And I have to wonder, if there had been a peephole in that door, would Jesus have even opened it? The door was open. There's Nicodemus. And we have all sorts of ways to wonder how the interaction went. For one thing, in the stories in the Bible, we don't have voice inflection and facial expression to help us understand how those conversations may have gone. But we can imagine, here Nicodemus, this Pharisee, is at the door where Jesus is staying. What could Jesus have said? Oh, come on, man, can't you see what time it is? Here you are. What is it you want now to taunt me some more, to try to trap me some more in the law? No. I think we can be pretty sure that it might have gone more like this. Oh, hey, <laughs> I kind of expected you because, you know, I know everything. Come on in and let's have some coffee. I just have to think, number one, that Jesus probably knew this was going to happen, but also Jesus knew and loved Nicodemus because Jesus knows and loves everybody. I know, that can seem like a sad truth about the Bible. <laughs> I don't love, well, I try to love everybody, but I mean, there are those people in our lives, right? You know, who grate on our nerves, who stand for absolutely everything that you don't stand for. You try to avoid them at every turn. But here Nicodemus is at Jesus' door, and Jesus welcomes him in. Now, the way we read the story, it sounds like it might have been rather contentious. 
But I also wonder if Jesus may not have had a twinkle in his eye, thinking, here is this man, this man I love, whose heart is opening up to explore his faith. And because Jesus knew Nicodemus, Jesus knew how to talk to Nicodemus. You know, you talk to some people one way and some people another way. Earlier this week, I texted Clay Ralston and said, if you're brave enough, call me. Because I knew that would get Clay to call me and about 30 seconds later, he did. <laughs> That's the kind of relationship Clay and I have. So Jesus was talking with Nicodemus. We don't know how long it lasted. We know Nicodemus then left. Probably perplexed, probably a little confounded, but we can be sure of this. That conversation about faith continued to work on Nicodemus because his story is one of the very few in the Bible that picks up again and picks up again. Sometime later, before the arrest, Nicodemus was with the Sanhedrin who had sent out some soldiers to arrest Jesus. They returned and went, no, no, we weren't ready to arrest him. Nicodemus stood up among those peers and said, isn't this man Jesus deserving of a hearing? Now he was just blown off by the Sanhedrin. <laughs> no, that was the end of it. But that tells us something was still going on in Nicodemus, that he was still exploring who this man Jesus was. And then we know after the arrest, and after the crucifixion, that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the lifeless body of Jesus at their own great personal expense and cared for it. We never have John record that Nicodemus ever said, you're my Lord and Savior, but we have to think that Nicodemus must have grown into an understanding of who Jesus was as the Son of God, that he would do that. I love that story. One of the other stories that we explored during Lent was that of the woman at the well. It's my favorite story. <laughs> it's my favorite story too. <laughs> We can't say she was the nameless woman at the well because she had a name. John just didn't record it. What a great story. Jesus was with his followers and decided it was time to head back to Galilee. And John records, I think John did this intentionally, John records that Jesus had to go through Samaria. No, he didn't. We know he didn't. No good Jew would go through Samaria. Good Jews took the long way around in order to avoid Samaria and its heathen half-breeds. But John says Jesus had to go through Samaria because Jesus knew a certain woman would be at a certain well and he wanted to have an encounter with her. And boy, did they ever. Her story takes up nearly all of one whole chapter in John. What a great exchange. Jesus looks into her eyes and into her soul and sees who she is. He knows her and loves her. Remember, Jesus loves everybody, yes, even Samarians and wants her to know she is a child of God. It could have gone more like this. <laughs> Should have known I'd find a floozy like you at the well in the heat of the afternoon. Respectable women don't come at this time of day. The respectable women come in the morning, when it's cool, when they can enjoy each other's company, maybe even a little gossip. And they probably gossip about you. You, you floozy. 
But that's not the way it went. <laughs> Jesus looked at her and saw her and loved her and wanted her to understand that, to understand not only who he was, but who she was as a child of God. There's an interesting thing that John does with her story. Early on, she says in the encounter, Oh, I see, sir, you are a prophet. But then a little later in the story, she asks, Could this be the Christ? And then near the end of the story, he is the Savior of the world. Now, what a progression! of an understanding of who Jesus is. What a way for John to tell her faith story. The story could have ended with her knowing she was loved by God, but she could not contain herself. <laughs> she dropped her container and went running back into the village. She had to share what had happened to her with people who shunned her. Like I said, she couldn't contain herself. And she must have been so winsome and so engaging in sharing her faith story that they had to go back with her to the well. They had to see this person for themselves. And we know that many of them came to believe as well at the well. <laughs> Here's a neat thing about that story. The Samaritans asked Jesus to stay a couple of days with them, and he did. Jesus, good Jew, stayed with half-breed heathen Samaritans because he knew them and loved them and wanted them to know their sacred worth as children of God. I love that story. Today, we look at Thomas, and his story is so short compared to Nicodemus's and the woman's. We hardly get any of it, and yet, it is probably more like our own stories than many of the others. Jesus was crucified and resurrected and reappeared to the disciples through a locked door, for Pete's sake. <laughs> but Thomas wasn't with them. He missed it. And the disciples told him about it, and he said, uh, yeah, sure, mm -hmm. I don't think so. Locked door? No. He was dead, remember? No. I'll believe it when I see it. Thinking, of course, he would never see it. But we know, because John tells us, that Jesus appeared again to the disciples. Now think about it. Why did Jesus do that? Because Jesus knew and loved Thomas and wanted to interact with him. He could have said, what is with you, man? You spend three years with me. I teach, I do wonders, we walk and talk together. Don't you know me? Don't you know what the prophet said about me? What is with you? But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus looked at Thomas and loved him and said, Come see. Let me show you. We really don't know much more about Thomas than that. He became a missionary and went out and spread the gospel. But that's about all we know. We know he had his doubts. We know they all had their fears. We know that Jesus understood and wanted to help them overcome that. Peace I give you, <laughs> he said to all of them. And to Thomas, come, see, let me show you. So that's three faith stories for today out of the Bible, biographical faith stories. Now it's time for an autobiographical story, yours. <laughs> Have you thought about your own faith story? You need to write it down. You need to tell it. 
You need to share it with those you love. They need to hear, like the people in Samaria did, like the people who witnessed Nicodemus' progression did. They need to know how Jesus has been at work in your life. Because he has. You know it. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to start at the day you were born through today. Just think about snippets. Think about ways that God has been very real in your life. Think about the first time you ever really realized God was, was real and was with you. And write that down. I would love for you to share it with me, <laughs> if you're willing. Email me, call me. I'd love to get together someday over coffee, <laughs> maybe someday in the not too distant future. But your faith story is every bit as important as Nicodemus's and the woman's and Thomas's and every other story that's in the Bible. The story continues through you. I hope you have a blessed Sabbath day. I hope you're able to rest a little and play a little. And I hope you're able to think about your faith story and maybe have an encounter with God today that just is an extra special surprise and blessing in your life. And we bow our hearts together in prayer. We give you thanks, O oh God, for the stories you give us of our faith ancestors, our family members, whose stories inspire us and challenge us and confound us, the stories that help draw us near to you. Thank you for your work in our lives. Help us today and in the days ahead to be more mindful of it. Help us to thank you for it. And help us to be brave enough, like the woman in Samaria, to share our story with another. That you may be blessed. We just give you thanks and praise in the midst of our awe and wonder. Amen.